pieces that have been ground up in the hopper. This one somehow made it all the way through the process. They cut it open to see if it's the actual head. It's the head, yes. It is the head. I think it'd be pretty close to the sheet. I don't know. That's are shaped. I know, but that show, it's not that the McDonald's are trying to get heads in, in town. What are they trying to do? Yeah, grind them up before you eat. But the point is, it shows when everything's in a hurry, you're cutting costs, you're pushing. Things like this can happen. She did sue and, did, and she got a little bit, but you can't really, you know, help with some of it. No, the bones actually had some issues. But now, McNuggets don't quite look like this today. They have changed the recipe, but this is a picture of McNuggets from five years or six years ago. Wouldn't you like a cone of that? <laughs> yeah, soft serve. So, no longer is that McNuggets, but who's had an ice cream cone in McDonald's? <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little chocolate and nuts. That's great. Now, it's not that this is bad. I mean, this is obviously, it's, it's round up as fine as they can so they can make it in those shapes. Chickens don't come in the shapes of them. I don't know if you knew that. But the point is, the more things are, anything, the more complex it is, the less we know what's in. And so the, the greater the chance that in cultural competition, they can cut corners. It's really easy to cut corners, but you have no idea what's round up in there. So think of it this way. Normally, the head is in that. Yes. So for the person who likes to put the head inside the little chicken McNugget carton, how did they not notice no, like, like hey, putting no, a chicken head in here? Think about what's going on. They it's busy. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, yeah, two things happen. First off, yeah. <laughs> yes. or what's more likely is that they're really busy. And so they're just, they're just grabbing whatever it's eight or 20, just getting them in there. And they're not sweet. She was probably complaining about her. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's that woman again. Take that. <laughs> no, what happens is there's. So I just want to show you that now it's more of a, now it's more of a, a white color. Oh. I think not like it is or something like that. Well, what was happening is this is very close. This is this actually chicken, but there's something called pink slime from meat, where they would take all the little bits of meat, little tiny bits of beef, and other things, and they would ground it up really fine and sell that as ground beef. And they called it pink slime, and they would sell it to things like school lunch programs and stuff like that. Well, technically, it's probably okay, but nobody knew what's in there. And that was the issue. It wasn't whether or not it was poisonous, but they never told people the process or what's in there. So clearly, they're, it's, it's fraud. Even if it's not necessarily bad, they're, they're, they're selling it as ground beef. It's like, what a great deal we have for you. And then once people found out, you know, they just kind of kept the soup. But you get things like, you know, go get frozen chicken patties at the store. That's what it is. Like I said, these are hot dogs. That's what hot dogs are before they shape them. But a hot dog is the same thing. Hot dog is just being a pebble next door. Always. Well, you know, they're the cheap. Hot dogs were the cheapest pieces, the cheapest leftover parts. So the higher level the sausage, the more you're going to have real meat. Hmm? Yeah, I meant, you mentioned vague meat and Cody can talk. Vague <laughs> meat. Yeah, I don't. I don't particularly like hot dogs unless I'm at a at a baseball game. Then you have to. I think it's the law. You're not a All right. So went to the jungle. Talk about those issues. And the reason I want to do that is to tell you about why regulation, what cultural competition was. Food really does cover that well. But out of the jungle, one more thing was going on at the exact same time. This became a national sensation. A national sensation. European countries, especially Britain, France, Germany, and Belgium, 
They're buying all this American food. Places like Belgium and, and Britain had to import a lot of their foodstuffs. And at first they're seeing, that's great, we can buy this food from the United States and it's not going to rot. But they started realizing that we're getting sick from this, it's swamp. And those great powers in Europe, Western European countries said, we're not going to buy that stuff from you anymore until you have some kind of standards. So you combine Europe with the jungle. This is actually really important. Europe and the jungle. Europe said we want standards. And once Europe said we're not going to buy your stuff, what did food processors in the United States want? Well, we need standards. Yeah, we need standards. Now we want standards. Because we need to sell our stuff. They want them as small as they can get them, but we want standards so we can tell Great Britain our food won't kill you. <laughs> Which is a good selling point. That could be like in their advertisement. Buy American, our food won't kill you. These, this would lead to two laws, 1906. These two things go hand in hand. They're mad about the jungle, the food processors, but then they jump on board because of this. The first one is the Pure Food and Drug Act. Which created the FDA, or the Food and Drug Administration. And this would set up a regulatory body appointed by the president. So this is part of the executive branch. The executive branch. And they will set standards for food production. Processed food, you have to, have to be truthful in your labeling. But drugs, the patent drug medicine, it was called the patent drug medicine, was totally out of control at this time where people were selling anything and saying it was a cure-all. And there was no checking at all. I mean, they were literally selling sometimes poison. And the idea about selling people things like all of them or things like that that would make them physically ill is because you would take it and you would get an immediate reaction. And they would say that reaction is your body healing itself. Right? So something to make you feel good. There was no controls whatsoever. And even though healthcare was getting exponentially better at this time, the vast majority of people could not afford it. And so this patent drug, they prey on working people, are sick, ill, desperate, and they would sell them this literal snake oil. And so they begin to investigate this and put limitations on it. And that's where you get, you know, maybe we can't sell heroin to little children. Just throwing that out there as a potential. Why not? Hmm? I know, why not? Buyer beware, right? <laughs> Next, the Meat Inspection Act. And both of these are still the law. They've been amended. They've been amended over the years with the Meat Inspection Act and the Pure Food and Drug Act. So they will go into the processing facilities and inspect meat. Now, there's not that many inspectors, a lot of it's self inspection, but the idea is they will come in and at least test samples occasionally. And same deal, this is a regulatory body, part of, the, part of the executive branch, and they will go through and set minimal requirements for meat and then test it. They still test it the same way. How do they test it? Smell, poke, see that. Smell, poke, look. There is some biological testing, but it's still not necessarily demanded. It's still smell, poke, look. But one of the things they do is, you know, they, for example, set the dates, how long a store can have meat out, or how long uh, meat can be in storage. That, that sort of thing, how long it can be aged. Because we like a little bit rotten, so how long is it going to be spoiled? It tenderizes a little bit. But, you know, it gets it's really not the most appetizing way to say we like rotten meat, but the kind of But the point is, these work, but here's the catch. It only applied to exports. Exports. The first year. Only for goods sold to Europe. And the food processors argued for this. And basically what it was is a pretty hackneyed compromise. What they said is, okay, we'll agree to those limits, but we're going to have all of this stuff that wasn't tested 
we still want to sell it to make money. So I said, okay, you can sell it to the American public for a year, and then start searching, or then start uh, selling, or had, everything had to be inspected afterwards. So that should tell you a lot about some of the issues of government that exist this very day. What really matters? When laws are being made, what matters? Yeah, who has the money and the power? They can get laws that are rigged to help them. So the American people getting poisoned? Hey, come on, deal with it. And the the standards are pretty low. And there's going to be a lot be a lot of amendments, but this was a big deal. But in reality, this is only one of three achievements of Teddy Roosevelt. And that leads us directly into a new heading of progressives, the national level progressives. The national progressives. Remember that interstate commerce? Interstate commerce, really limited. Really limited. The, <coughs> excuse me. Are we good? Yeah, good. Really limited the state level reforms. And so the realization hit for progressives, if they really want action, it's got to be at the national level which is going to be much harder, much harder. The progressives were not strong in the South. And so there's a big block that won't vote for them. In other areas, they were not that strong either. But in a way, the progressives would accidentally get in. 1901, what did Leon Jolgosk do? Yeah, with what? A wild boar. Remember, it's for a wild boar in his lap. Remember the headline of the paper? Use the pistol. He used the pistol. He assassinated Teddy Roosevelt. And now, who's the president? Does he assassinate Teddy Roosevelt? Yeah. <laughs> wow, that was a shock. <laughs> now that damn cowboy's in the White House. T.R. By the way, he hated to be called Teddy. Hated it. It's Theodore. Hated it. Just like Abraham Lincoln hated to be called Abraham or Abe. Hated it. What did I used to call him? Mr. Lincoln. So his wife called him Mr. Lincoln. Mr. Lincoln. It was either president or Mr. Lincoln. That's what he liked. So either one. So Teddy Roosevelt, TR. And Roosevelt came in. There's a lot of things to talk about Teddy Roosevelt, but the most important thing was is that, yes, he's going to lead to progressive reforms, but he came in literally as a ball of energy. He changed everything. There had not been a president like him since Andrew Jackson that had pushed so hard for laws and action. Maybe a little bit James Knox Cole, but that's it. Yes, Lincoln was a strong president, but he didn't have this agenda and use the power of the presidency to push for laws. Teddy Roosevelt called it the bully pulpit. A pulpit is where a minister gives a sermon, and so the idea was he will use the presidency by giving a sermon. Use that power and the press that presidents get to push Congress to act. The bully pulpit. Hmm? Oh, not, not the Patriots. Yeah. He was very Protestant. He didn't trust the Catholics. He figured the Catholics were really taking orders from the Pope. All right. right. If anyone's Catholic here, we know you're only loyal to the Pope, right? <laughs> That's a done deal, right? <laughs> now you have your piece. That's what Native is thought. So back to this. The bully pop, Poland. And so, never before. He would send phonographs, phonograph records of his speeches, and people would listen to him in auditoriums to hear Teddy Roosevelt talk. You know, pre-radio, this is revolutionary. He kind of had a high voice, almost kind of squeaky. And it seems weird to think about Teddy Roosevelt. I don't know why you imagine this deep voice. You know, this guy used to box and beat the heck out of people in the basement of the White House. Yet at the same time, he had this really high voice. But without much amplification, high voices actually work better over big rooms. Abraham Lincoln had a high voice, too. 
Hmm? What? No. Wait. <laughs> so, and it doesn't matter a lick, but it does. And actually, without without amplification, high voices do go out of a crowd better. So back to this. There had never been anybody like him, and he had a program. And the point is, the president promised action. I will get things done. Now there's a problem. The president can say this, but presidents don't pass laws. What passes laws? And if Congress doesn't vote for it, it's not done. There's a problem. Once you start saying it's not happened, that it doesn't happen, who do people blame? Because the, the president doesn't pass laws. So, every other president, more and more are going to copy Teddy Roosevelt, what he did. And so, in a way, this will make the president much more powerful. The president's going to get much more credit when things go well. But there's a problem. When things go bad, who do people blame? The president. When something happens, what do people say? The president should have done this. The president should have done that. All the time. Today. People didn't think like that before it starts with Teddy Roosevelt. Before him. So Roosevelt's going to have a lot of impact. And so that bully pulpit, and he would beat his chest and give speeches, he actually didn't get a lot done. There are a couple things he did in his first years as president. A couple things. And one of these is going to be he did actually have a relative success in labor unions. There was an anthracite coal worker strike. West Virginia and Colorado. And almost always before this, the presidents stood on which side? If there's a strike between workers and management, who did the president side with? The last big moment was during, remember, 1894, when the president sent out the troops to put down the Bullman strike. Roosevelt did not do this. Roosevelt came out and was a fair arbiter. Roosevelt came out and used arbitration. For he would negotiate agreement between the two sides. And it was relatively fair. When the strike ended, the union technically didn't get recognized. It was so complex. But the union got some of its demands. And so the first time in American history, the president came out as at least a fair arbiter. Roosevelt would call it an honest broker, and that's what his, co his cousin, Franklin Roosevelt, would talk about. I am a broker between different groups. Now, he, wasn't, he didn't trust some unions, and he would use troops, for example, in Coeur d'Alene to put down a strike. But the point is, this is a radical change. But other than that, there weren't big things that Roosevelt did those first few years he's president. It was more just action. Action. And so, in 1904, Roosevelt's going to run for election. Now, when I say not a lot, I'm talking domestically. Foreign policy-wise, he's done the Roosevelt Corollary, got the Panama Canal, basic diplomacy, but not internal. He didn't really, he sounded a little progressive, but not really. He didn't yet call himself a progressive. And so in the election of 1904, the election of 1904, this is going to be a big election. Marcus Hanna, who's now a senator, is still the money man. And he is funneling money into Roosevelt's campaign. He's funneling money in. Is that a map of this campaign? Just one sec. Does the book have a map of this? No one's helping me. You're all looking at me. Huh, not there. Okay. So, in 1904, Roosevelt's going to run. And he does something absolutely amazing. He gives his campaign a slogan that has meat behind it. That has a real goal. It's not just an empty slogan like Tippy Canoe and Tyler 2. Or even the kind of weird you know, ones that are something other to do with people in the United States, like 5440 or 5. 
or this gray one that McKinley had, a chicken in every pot. Well, how are you going to do that? Go and cook people food? But that was his slogan, chicken in every pot. Hoover was chicken in every pot and a car in every garage. But in 1904, Teddy Roosevelt came up with a slogan. His slogan was a square deal. It was brilliant. It's one of the most brilliant political moves in American history. He gave a speech where he described his square deal. Let me read, to the, read you this real fast. I can't do as high a voice, but I'll do my best. Let the watch words of all our people be the familiar watch words of honesty, decency, fair dealing, and common sense. And I'll stop right there. That means nothing. Here everybody says, it. I pledge to you that I'll be honest. Yeah, of course you do. But we must treat each man on his worth and his merits as a man. Okay. We must see that each is given a square deal because he is entitled to no more and should receive no less. So once again, yeah, it just works. Here's the meat of it. The welfare of each of us is dependent fundamentally on the welfare of us all. We are as strong as the weakest link. Has everyone got that? The square deal put that concept of social justice as a presidential goal. He called it social welfare. The welfare of one depends on the welfare of us all. And the only one that can do it, that can guarantee that, is government. Nothing else is big enough. Nothing else has the power. And there's one more important thing. Individuals are greedy. Only the government can do it for everybody. Now, does that work? Yeah, sometimes government's greedy. I mean, it's more complex than that. But this is a radical change. It's a radical change. He ran... Well, no, let's get parts of the square deal. Because when he was saying stuff like that, Marcus Hanna is sitting there going, does he mean it? Nah, he doesn't mean it. It's just talk. It's just talk. He doesn't mean it. So Hanna actually funneled a lot of money. Johnny Rockefeller would give hundreds of thousands of dollars to Roosevelt. So would J.P. Morgan. Because they sincerely believe the square deal was just talk. And what did Roosevelt do? He took their money. You want to give me money? I'll take it and become president. But what was he going to do? This group. What he thought was best. And they would get revenge, by the way. They would get. But still, what did the square deal say? It's very, very, very much like the old populist plank of 1892. Remember that one from 1892? The Omaha platform is a lot like this. So it said these things. First off, these old basics from there. Eight hour day. What does an eight hour day do to wages? Raises all wages. What's workers' comp? What's workers' compensation? Yeah. If somebody's running the job, there's an insurance that will help pay for their um, pay for them while they are hurt. And by you know, anything like that. These in a test. You're hurt, you're fired. Old age pension. Remember I told you, old age was synonymous with what? Yeah. yeah. So this was going to be a pension that you would get when you were too old to work, too young to die. And there's a logic to it. Yeah. What about the steam rooms? Like, that you were saying about yesterday? Mm -hmm. Wow. What would happen with that workers' comp? Like, yeah. Workers' comp, then if they were hurt in there, if there was a workers' comp, yeah. and let's say an arm, or they were killed, then their family would be compensated they right. and received like an insurance annuity every month, like a paycheck. But he didn't get this. This wouldn't happen until FDR. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. I'm presenting these as remember these same old goals. And the point is this working men and women had to fight really hard to get these things. Now, frankly, we all take advantage of them. Don't realize how, if you can, if the loss may pass to give you these things, what else can happen? Of course. And the same kind of people who didn't want it before are the same kind of people who run companies today. I mean, people just take these things for granted. Old age pension. By the way, his cousin would do this too. What is the old age pension? Social Security. Social Security. Which is without a doubt the most successful thing the United States government has ever done. Ever. It is amazing how effective it is. And yeah. 
and it's efficient. Next. Of course, I'm saying that because I'm getting close to it. Next. Yeah, maybe one or two more years and I'll be bedridden, infirmed. <laughs> it's kind of scary, if it's true. So I got at least three. All right, next. Child labor. What did he want? More children in the workforce. They're in the Korea East Room, right there in the corner. Right? Who's with me? No, he wanted child labor laws. Not only for the actual well-being of the child, but what does child labor laws do to wages? Raises all wages. Next, he also wanted antitrust regulations. Antitrust regulations. He also wanted safety regulations, like food and workers regulations. He also wanted you know, there's a lot of stuff, isn't it? But it's very close. Conservation of the environment. First American president to push for this. The turn of the century, there was an there there was appeared to be an environmental catastrophe going on. And the realization hit. There's like a ton of bricks. Oh my god. We're gonna run out of trees. Then what will we use? Next, progressive income tax. Progressive income tax means not only will, be a, will there be a tax on income, but also what will tax rates do? The more wealth you have, the higher your taxes. And remember, this is not just because it, it does a little bit of um, redistribution because in capitalism, the profits go to the top. It also you tax where the money is, but also High, really high marginal income tax rates to watch all wages for virtually everybody else. Increases. Yeah, it increases wages. It increases wages. So, of course, one of the best ways for the wealthy to keep their money is not just to pay lower taxes, but it also, you lower the income tax, it allows them to lower the wages. They also wanted estate taxes. Roosevelt was actually really clear about estate taxes, the taxes on very big inheritances. He was a wealthy aristocrat from a wealthy aristocratic family. And he would say, why should other people work hard and their work is taxed? Work is taxed much more than me doing nothing but being born and having more money than you. Why should work be taxed more than inheritance? It's a good question. Because most people have to work for everything they get. Me included. Not you. Who, who here is going to inherit millions? Can you get me on your payroll? <laughs> and lastly, I'm forgetting something. Oh, regulation of the stock market. Regulation of stock market and banks. Can anybody read that? <laughs> Just imagine that's a stock market and banks. No squeaks. Oh, no. Look, the old make pins like they used to. <laughs> yeah, he got it on the bank. God. No, it's inside. I don't know if it's inside. 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 Class. It has some foreign language in it. Okay, so that's a square deal. And it was really effective. Did anyone really care about these things? Not really. What did they care about? Teddy Roosevelt has promised me a square deal. It's brilliant. He cares about me. Teddy Roosevelt cares about me. A square deal. That's awesome. I'm going to be treated well. How? I don't care. I trust. After this, everyone's going to start using slogans. And they'll get specifics, but no one cares about the specifics. All they care about is the slogan. 
Now you can say, why do you like Teddy Roosevelt? Oh, that square deal. That square deal is going to help people. It's going to help. It's going to bring difference. It's going to bring change. Square deal. They're all going to follow it. 1912, Roosevelt wrote new nationalism. Woodrow Wilson wrote new freedom. What does that even mean? New freedom? Warren G. Harding's going to have back to normalcy. What? Who cares? It's a slogan. Teddy Roosevelt's cousin, kind of by accident, would come up with the most brilliant one. What? Franklin Roosevelt was what? I'm going to throw this pin at every single person in here. You know? Someone says, the New Deal. The New Deal. It was kind of by accident, but now he took his cousin. Uh, Harry Truman, the fair deal. There are the deals after that. Eisenhower would be dynamic conservatism. Kennedy, the new frontier. Johnson, the great society. You just go on and on. George W. Bush was compassionate conservatism. Obama, hope and change. Hope and change. What does that even mean? <laughs> It's, no, it doesn't matter, but it sounds good, right? The problem is, once you have a slogan and say, I'm going to do these things, you don't do it, you're blank. Why am I missing? Must be the win. Mike, once again. Yeah, I know. You didn't do anything, and that's why I missed. Okay, so his opponent, yes. How many of these did he actually get? We'll get to it in one second. Okay. His opponent was Alton Parker. Do you need to know Alton Parker? No. <laughs> Nobody knew Alton Parker. Al Alton Parker was crushed. The Democrats actually put the railroad lawyer, who is significantly more loss I fair than the Republican. It's like they totally flip flopped. It was doomed. Alton Parker had never even run for office. You didn't know who the guy was. He was crushed. Roosevelt won an easy, re or technically it's re-election because he was elected vice president. And he's not president. On his own merit. And what did he do? He started going after the trust. He started passing laws, or going after the very same people who gave him all that money. And they would get their revenge. Trust me. They do not forget. But he would have three and a half successes. The first big success we've already talked about, the Pure Food and Drug Act, the FDA Meat Inspection Act, that's a little bit of a regulation. Next, another regulation he would have that was successful on a safety regulation, the Hepburn Act. The Hepburn Act would give more teeth to the ICC. Remember the Interstate Commerce Commission that regulated railroads. It would actually, and it would expand. The ICC would also eventually regulate other things, but they would um, amend that. It's called the Man Elkins Act. It would amend that and it would include things like, uh, like telegraph and telephone. Eventually they would create something separate to regulate that. Hepburn Act. It, it strengthened the ICC, the big one. So it gave teeth to railroad re regulations. Railroad so regulation. Mm -hmm. Next, if he had some success in conservation of the environment. Now, to be clear, conservation is a concept that means this. You want to conserve things today. Why? Use it tomorrow. And so, yes, it's the beginning of the modern environmental movement, but it's complex. And there is a tie-in between the environmental movement that there are, there are very important ecological and uh, climate issues that deal with protecting the environment, but they also unify with conservation groups that want to preserve um, the environment to use it later or whatever. But this conservation was the realization hit going in to the 20th century that they had cut down approximately 97% of the trees. Every tree that was easy to get to, they cut down. 
they've got to conserve it. And so it's going to strengthen the interior department. So it's going to strengthen the interior department. But the big thing is, it's going to create a forest service. And the forest service will actively manage, govern the people's property, property owned by the people of the United States, government property. It'll actively manage this so there'll be trees to use later. And that is what the Forest Service does to this day. And so the Interior Department is normally given the control of the land, but the Forest Service is actually in the Agricultural Department. The idea is we'll harvest these trees later. They, by definition, they have to now be very much related to the Interior Department. Because the Interior Department also manages land, that's under the Bureau of Land Management. And he, it's really this kind of a messed up system that should be the same group, but they're technically different. And they also set up the Monuments Act. Congress would pass this, and this will allow the president to designate areas, designate areas that will be protected and preserved. And there's a number of different areas in Montana, one like Lewis Clark Capitals was designated. And it just allows the president, the big one, there are a couple big areas that he wanted to designate. But one of the biggies is right here, Monument Park in this area here. This beautiful high desert here, Rosa wanted to protect. And also this part of North Dakota, which eventually become a national park, and other places. So the president can do that today. The president does this. President Obama has suggested some areas for designation. A lot of times the president will do it, uh, designate these areas that will be safe forever, right when they're leaving office. Like President Clinton did a bunch when he left office in 2001. And then there's one more, the one that has the most direct impact. It's called the uh, Reclamation Act. And the Reclamation Act's goal was to reclaim land, meaning take arid or desert land and have it used for agriculture. That's the Reclamation Act. And this is going to have huge impact because what's the Reclamation Act going to do? How do you turn desert into land? We say thought. Look at my words right thought, but turn desert or arid land into land use for agriculture. Irrigation. irrigation. Where do you get the water for irrigation? You pump it from where? You just pump it. No. I... Hmm? <laughs> from where? What do you, I didn't hear what you said. You just pump it? <laughs> Where do you get water? You make it? <laughs> no, what do you do? You grow it? <laughs> well water is not enough. And they yet they did not get out of technology to go really deep yet. What do you do? What's that? Rivers. What do you do? It's the Reclamation Act which turned out to be the biggest damn building program in history. <laughs> All year to say the biggest damn program. <laughs> yeah, they begin to build dams. And so almost all the dams, the dam itself might be regulated by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, which actually you know, would design it, but the waters, the Bureau of Reclamation. So a Canyon Ferry, the Bureau of Reclamation. And the idea was they would have it for regular people. And it didn't quite work that way, but they would begin to dam and irrigate. Yes? Hoover Dam, it, it would, the, the Congress would pass a law in in 31, but it would not, it would be a New Deal project. That would and they tried to change the name to Boulder Dam, but then Republicans took over Congress and they named, renamed it Hoover. So now what is it? Uh, uh, Hoover Dam and Boulder, I mean, it's a really complex name. The Republicans wanted a Republican president, the Democrats did not want Hoover. All right, so, who's been to Hoover Dam? It's really cool. Did you slide down this, did you do that? You can just jump over and slide all the way down the dam, it's fine. You only do it once. <laughs> so, back to this. The big dam building program, and, Especially when the New Deal hit during the Great Depression, uh, all the way up through the 1960s, they had pretty much built a dam on every single place in the United States that's good to have a dam. 
there's really no place else to build dams. And some of the dams they built are really bad places. They're built on limestone. And a couple of them broke. One dam called the Glen Canyon Dam, they built on limestone and someday it might break. And if that goes, so it's on the Colorado, that means Hoover Dam will go and all the way down and good town. <laughs> it's in Utah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So why, so why will that one? If one dam goes, it's a bucket. Right. So then all this water will rush down and take every dam will go with it. It's Hoover Dam's not the biggest. Hoover Dam's not all. I mean, it's a big dam, but it's not huge. Right? But it's very similar in size. Yeah. It, it, okay. So. We'll stop right there. Write down one more word, though. Antitrust. Oh, no, I lied. Not antitrust. Stop. Stop! <laughs> Write down, I'm sorry, I meant to say trust us. That, that is three words. Trust us. You know what I think I'd like all of you to have? A better than average week. I can't give you more than that. You have to go out on your own to make yourself into a great weekend. I don't know how you make yourself into that. And don't let Michael sabotage you. Don't No, don't forget that short answer question I gave you yesterday, remember? No, everyone's just kind of looking at me. Do you remember that? Yeah. All right, let's go on Tuesday. I forgive you. That made even less sense. Are we going to do the thing? Yeah, let's go ahead and talk about it. Do you have any ideas what you, what you were thinking? Well, I was. Oh, wait, wait, let me shut off the camera. Oh, oops. <laughs>